What is the Christian view of heaven? Many argue going to heaven would be awful and basically a living hell, that they would prefer to be annihilated out of existence instead of living for an eternity without free will or fun. But this is based on a simplistic and fallacious view of what heaven will be like. Many skeptics have incorrectly assumed in heaven there will be no fun, no free will, and no pain. Heaven is far more than we can imagine, a time and a place beyond what we could ever picture. Yet there are some things we can know about heaven from hints in scripture. The first thing to note is there will be free will in heaven. There has to be, since the Bible says at one point there was a war in heaven. Satan and his angels could not have rebelled if there was no free will or capacity to sin. Nothing in the Bible ever suggests that we lose free will when we get to heaven. The reason we are unlikely to sin in heaven is the same reason that as a toddler you put things in your mouth you weren't supposed to, but now that you've matured you know better and freely choose not to. When we are before the Lord we will not desire to sin. We will know how awful and disgusting sin really is, something we have a hard time understanding during our earthly existence just as a toddler might not understand why it is bad to put random things in their mouth. Over time, we will continue to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit until all thought of sin is completely gone from our minds. We will always have the free will to sin, but once we have been fully sanctified, we will know from our experience and memories of our lives on earth that sinning would be like eating fecal matter. Currently, we have the free will to do that now, but we don't because we know how terrible it would be. God will sanctify us so we realize how terrible sin is, and we will freely choose to reject it. But because of this process, we know there will be pain in heaven, initially. Nothing in the Bible suggests there won't be pain in heaven once we arrive to be with Christ. An important part of being a Christian is sanctification. This is where the Holy Spirit slowly transforms and renews our minds to be more like Christ. However, as Soren Kierkegaard noted, sin is like a sickness we have until death. We are never fully sanctified in this life. And I agree with the theologians that point out sanctification is not just magically completed at death. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis paints a scenario of souls in hell getting a free trip to heaven so that the saints there have the opportunity to convince them to stay. However, most reject this free gift and opt to go back to hell. Heaven is torturous for them. Lewis describes the grass as being as sharp as diamonds for the ghosts from hell. The fruit, the noise, all torture those from hell. But the saints, or solid people, try to tell them that if they only stay, they will learn to love this place. The grass will become soft and the food will fill them up so that they can become solid. They only have to stay and let themselves be changed from ghosts into solid people and this place will become a paradise. But such a process terrifies the ghosts and they opt to return back to the safety of hell. Because what Lewis is referring to is analogous to the process of sanctification, which is very painful at times. It is painful to give up on your pride and greed and learn to love without selfish reasons in mind. Transforming us to be Christ-like will take a lot of time, effort, and pain. Learning the universe doesn't revolve around you is a hard fact to learn and even harder to live out. It is similar to when one decides they need to lose weight and live a healthier lifestyle. The first few days are exhausting and miserable. Changing your diet and lifestyle can be painful and it takes time to adjust. But if one progresses past the initial stages, they begin to feel immensely better. Your energy level, mental clarity, and overall well-being increase and you begin to see how you live your life in a whole new way. A painful part of this process that will have to take place is dealing with the sins of our past. St. Paul reminds us that we will have to give an account of everything we have done before God. This is not to shame or punish us, but to help us learn the true destruction our sin can cause as part of our sanctification. 
if a rapist, on his deathbed, begs for forgiveness, God will accept him, but he will still have to feel the pain and the weight his sin has caused, as we all will. We will all have to learn the suffering our actions caused and experience how truly terrible sin is. But God, who is love, will only be there weeping with us, as he once suffered for us all on earth. It is true the rapist and his victim will spend eternity together, but this will only be after the rapist has been sanctified in the love of God and begs for forgiveness before those he harmed. The victims themselves will only be able to forgive, having received true fulfillment and love from their own Lord. The love of God will fill us all so that any pain of the past will have no more meaning. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis describes the miseries of hell as an endless abyss. But when he gets to heaven, they describe hell quite differently. My teacher gave a curious smile. Luke, he said, and with the word he went down on his hands and knees. I did the same, how it hurt my knees, and presently saw that he had plucked a blade of grass. Using its thin end as a pointer, he made me see, after I had looked very closely, a crack in the soil so small that I could not have identified it without this aid. I cannot be certain, he said, that this is the crack you came up through, but through a crack no bigger than that you certainly came. But, I gasped with a feeling of bewilderment not unlike terror, I saw an infinite abyss and cliffs towering up and up, and then this country on top of the cliffs. Aye, but the voyage was not mere locomotion. That bus and all you inside it were increasing in size. Do you mean then that hell, or that infinite empty town, is down in some little crack like this? Yes, all hell is smaller than one pebble of your earthly world but it is smaller than one atom of this world, the real world. Look at yon butterfly. If it swallowed all hell, hell would not be big enough to do it any harm or to have any taste. It seems big enough when you're in it, sir. And yet all loneliness, angers, hatreds, envies and itchings that it contains, if rolled into one single experience and put into the scale against the least moment of the joy that is felt by the least in heaven, would have no weight that could be registered at all. Bad cannot succeed even in being bad, as truly as good is good. If all hell's miseries together entered the consciousness of yon wee yellow bird on the bough there, they would be swallowed up without trace, as if one drop of ink had been dropped into that great ocean to which the terrestrial Pacific itself is only a molecule. All the misery of earth will be swallowed up in a sea of love within heaven. All will be forgiven and forgiven the family of God, as we have found true and lasting fulfillment in Christ. No doubt that the process of sanctification and repenting of our past will be hard at times, much harder than simply changing your diet. But this is what Christ has planned for us, and in the end, through being refined by the fire of God's love, we will be changed and renewed so that we could not imagine living another way. We will freely deny ourselves for the glory of the Lord as He denied Himself to save us. This is why we know heaven will not be boring or torturous for an eternity. The idea is based on a selfish assumption. Heaven is supposed to be a self-glorifying reward for all who earn it. Like some sort of vacation resort in the sky, where you finally get all the pleasures and gratifications you were denied on earth. Such beliefs may exist in more primitive religions, but not for those who follow Christ. C.S. Lewis says a place where you can have all your earthly desires would be hell not heaven. Heaven is in fact the opposite. It is where we learn to live in existence where we do not live for ourselves or our own pleasures. Earthly pleasures never really fill us up. They may satisfy us for a time, but all they do is direct our focus inward on our finite soul. If that was our aim in eternity, it would be no wonder that over time we would burn out parts of our soul to satisfy. In fact, that is precisely what hell is. So it is no wonder heaven would be the opposite. It is no wonder that Jesus 
warned us about trying to focus too much on the pleasures of this world and not the treasures of heaven. For the treasures of heaven are not desires of the flesh or earthly gratifications, things which can destroy our soul. The treasures of heaven are found in the love of God, the beautiful, endless, unadulterated love of God, which is the only thing that could fill us up for eternity. Heaven is a place where we learn to truly love and be loved. We only have a small glimpse of such a love in this life. When we love someone, not out of a romantic infatuation or just getting a quick high, the love never truly dies. It only grows the more it remains. We do not simply grow tired of loving. A good parent does not outgrow loving their child when they love the child for simply the sake of the child. The love only grows stronger and more filling. The same applies to a couple that has lived a long life together. When the physical attractions die, the love only blossoms into something more beautiful, so that it only gets better with time. Heaven will be that and more, a place where we deny ourselves and our prideful desires to love and glorify God simply for the sake of God Himself. There will be no thought of getting bored or running out of ways to gratify ourselves. We will be too busy loving all of God's children and expressing our love for God who is before us. Heaven will not be about you or what you want to do. It will be about what you can do for others. If you ever got bored of that, it would be because you have not truly given yourself up, because your focus would still be on you and what you can get out of it. That is not what heaven will be, but what you can give to God and what you can do for your fellow heirs. We will know what it truly means to love and never grow tired of sharing that with others. Many of those who have chosen hell over heaven have scoffed at the idea of worshiping God for eternity. Why would you want to spend your days as a slave praising some god? Is it not better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven? But praise is only a natural consequence of love. C.S. Lewis says, We all despise the man who demands continued assurance of his own virtue, intelligence, or delightfulness. We despise still more the crowd of people around every dictator, every millionaire, every celebrity who gratify that demand. Thus a picture, at once ludicrous and horrible, both of God and of his worshippers, threatened to appear in my mind. The Psalms were especially troublesome in this way. Praise the Lord! O oh, praise the Lord with me! Praise him! Worse still was the statement put into God's own mouth, Whoso offereth me thanks and praise, he honoureth me. It was hideously like saying, What I want most is to be told that I am good and great. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honour. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favourite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favourite game, praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, historical personages, children, flowers, mountains, rare stamps, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time most balanced and capacious minds praised most, while the cranks, misfits and malcontents praised least. The good critics found something to praise in many imperfect works. The bad ones continually narrowed the list of books we might be allowed to read. The healthy and unaffected man even if luxuriously brought up and widely experienced in good cookery, could praise a very modest meal. The dyspeptic and the snob found fault with all. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? 
Don't you think that's magnificent? The psalmists, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. It is frustrating to have discovered a new author and not be able to tell anyone how good he is, to come suddenly at the turn of the road upon some mountain valley of unexpected grandeur, and then to have to keep silent because the people with you care for it no more than for a tin can in the ditch, to hear a good joke and to find no one to share it with. We worship and praise God because we love Him for who He is and what He has done. It is the prideful and contemptuous souls that only praise themselves or do not praise anything. They could never imagine praising that which is pure love and beauty. When you truly love someone for who they are, you cannot help but want to praise them and call others to engage in the act of praise. In heaven, we will know what it is to love like Christ and we will want to praise Him as a natural result, just as God loves and rejoices over us in songs. It is not as if God will simply be demanding worship in heaven. He will be singing to us in love as we praise Him in return. As C.S. Lewis says, It is along these lines that I find it easiest to understand the Christian doctrine that heaven is a state in which angels now and men hereafter are perpetually employed in praising God. This does not mean, as it can so dismally suggest, that it is like being in church. For our services, both in their conduct and in our power to participate, are merely attempts at worship, never fully successful. To see what the doctrine really means, we must suppose ourselves to be in perfect love with God, drunk with, drowned in, dissolved by that delight which, far from remaining pent up within ourselves as incommunicable, hence hardly tolerable bliss, flows out from us incessantly again in effortless and perfect expression, our joy no more separable from the praise in which it liberates and utters itself than the brightness a mirror receives is separable from the brightness it sheds. The Scotch Catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But we shall then know that these are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify Him, God is inviting us to enjoy Him. And this explains why it is absurd when one asks if heaven is so grand, why not go right away? The whole question is based on the assumption heaven is about self-serving, whereas heaven is giving yourself to God and allowing Him to sanctify you. In that sense, it is absurd to suggest we ought to commit suicide and go to heaven. Our eternity in heaven began the moment Christ came into our lives. We would not gain anything truly heavenly if we selfishly decided to kill ourselves in hopes of crossing over to a better existence. The act would only be driven by self-centeredness and drive us further away from our goal. Finding heaven requires a change in the heart, first and foremost. When we give our lives to Christ, we allow the Holy Spirit to bring us to the Father as He sees fit, and we allow Him to grow heaven within us. As for our loved ones who chose grief and misery in hell over God in heaven, we will not be consumed by their loss. If we were, then we would never have truly experienced God and His joy. Once we understand hell was the rejection of God, and we see what they have become in their hate for God, there will be no desire left to keep them around. For the same reason, a good wife has no problem leaving her abusive husband once she sees what he has become and how he now treats her. What we once loved in them will have been dissolved in their own self-centeredness. The light of God that used to shine in them, that shines in us all, will have gone out, and we will realize what we truly loved 
it was the image of God shining through them. As a Christian, what we learn is our entire identity is founded in Christ. That is where all our meaning and fulfillment will come from, and it will enable us to truly love others. If someone we loved were to reject this foundation out of their own pride and self-worth, it would be like rejecting us. All the personality we once loved in them will be dissolved in the fire of their own sin, and someone truly fulfilled in God will not be affected by that. We will understand their rejection of God is a rejection of us, and that they will only drag us down to their hell if we clung to them. In our state with God, it won't be possible for them to hold our feelings hostage. We will be filled with the love and praise of God and know that no other human can really fulfill us as we need. But it doesn't simply end there with that. Praise and worship with our lips is not the whole story. The epistle to the Colossians reminds us that whatever we do can be praise for the Creator. Jesus said himself, when we care for the least of us, we are doing it for Him. Heaven is not an endless church service. We were created for far more than just that. St. Paul says that when we die, we go to be with Christ, but that state is only temporary. The true end of our story is not an eternal bliss in some far off place, but the resurrection and renewal of all things in this universe. The most important part of our eternity will be being with God and endlessly learning the mind of our eternal Lord. But he has far more planned for us. One of those things will take us back to our beginnings. Humans were placed in the Garden of Eden to tend to it, but that was only the beginning. They were commanded to subdue and rule over all of creation, to take the glory of God all over earth. However, we failed and gave into self-centeredness, but that was not the end of our story. Jesus came to redeem us and with his resurrection, he began the new creation that Eden was supposed to initiate. When the Great Commission is successful and all the saints are accounted for and sanctified, then the next chapter in our story will begin. The book of Revelation says the new heaven and earth will come down to us, not that we will abandon this universe. When our minds have been renewed by God, then our bodies shall be as well and we shall inherit the cosmos as we were meant to reign over when we were called to do so in Eden. From there, our true worship of God shall begin. We will begin the process of turning the whole planet into Eden. Then, the rest of the cosmos is waiting for us. Heaven is not singing on a cloud for eternity or drinking on a beach surrounded by virgins. Heaven is God working through all of us in perfect love to bring about a new creation that will bring joy and peace to all creatures throughout the universe. We shall carry the song of Eden to every creature of every corner of the universe, and then beyond.